Welcome to Lessons from History. I'm your host, Paul Bruno. And today we're going to be talking with uh, the founder of Lessons from History, Mark Kozik Holland, about his book, Project Management Blunders, Lessons from the Project that Built, Launched, and Sunk, Titanic. Titanic was built by Harland & Wolf, the premier shipbuilder in the world. The project was fully funded, had a solid business case, and no expenses were spared. She was operated by White Star, a leader in transatlantic shipping. So why did the maiden voyage end up in a complete disaster? Are there learning lessons for modern business in the world of projects? Mark is the author of the, the aforementioned new book, Project Management Blunders, Lessons from the Project that Built, Launched, and Sunk Titanic, and we will reference that book in this interview. Mark is the creator of the Lessons from History series, written for organizations applying today's emerging technologies to common business problems. The series uses relevant historical case studies to examine how great historical projects and emerging technologies of the past solved complex problems. It then draws comparisons to the challenges encountered in today's project and project failures. Mark joins us now from Ontario, Canada. Mark, we have all heard of Titanic, but why is the story still relevant today? Uh, yes, Paul. It provides strong lessons in what could go wrong in projects today. Even though this happened a century ago, there are many parallels to modern project failures. A recent survey of um, projects indicate that project failure rates are about 25 to 30 percent today. So up to a third of all of today's projects fail? Correct. And, you know, that's just the tip of the iceberg. Um, around, third, around 50 percent of projects are seriously challenged at some point in their lifetime. So, uh, no pun intended, tip of the iceberg talking about the Titanic, right? Right. Absolutely. <laughs> Why did you write the book, Project Management Blunders? To give today's business people a, a very strong case study to draw lessons on. Uh, Titanic's track record of four years in development and four days in operation is a really good example of how a, a project can fail disastrously. So, how does your book differ from other Titanic books? Well, the book doesn't dwell too much on the main voyage, but really examines the whole project. Uh, I perform a post-mortem on the entire project. Project managers regularly perform uh, project mo uh, post-mortems to take away lessons learned to their other projects. Uh, the the post-mortem also provides the host organization with best practices that can be shared with other projects. In, in, pro in many projects, problems only start to surface in the implementation of a project. Uh, so this kind of analysis is, is very useful as it helps identify root causes to problems. Titanic's disaster has been put down to bad luck, an accident, and caused by the unforeseen forces of nature. The ship was sunk after glancing a blow with an iceberg, was it not? Well, that's the conventional wisdom. It, it, it really is around the situation being out of control of the captains and officers who are depicted as, as just mere bystanders uh, incapable of changing the course of events. In your book, you put forward a very different version of the disaster in an end scenario where Titanic was grounded on the ice shelf and then surprisingly taken off? Yes, yes. There's, there's very much evidence to support a grounding of Titanic. What is interesting is she was taken off the ice shelf with the view of proceeding to Halifax. In many ways, this was just a continuation of very poor decision-making that really had started much earlier in the project itself. The, the seeds of the disaster were sown as Titanic was designed, and there was a long chain of mistakes in the whole project. So why don't we cover the disaster later, because we should discuss the project sequentially so we can fully appreciate what went on in the preceding phases that ended up in a disaster. Right, and the, the project sequencing was really based on best practices that had been honed other shipyards over many, many decades. Um, it started with a very short planning phase, which was followed by a design phase of about seven months. Now, the construction phase was the longest phase. It took about three months, uh, three years. And in that time, the, the shell of the ship would be completed. Now, the shell would have only the decks fitted, and the ship would then be, be launched. Now, the following phase to the launch was, was called the fitting out. Now, this took 11 months. And really, what it involved was building everything inside the, the ship itself, from the staterooms to the cabins, uh, but also to all the systems that had to be uh, implemented, like the uh, propulsion systems, the steering systems, the communication systems. So finally, at the end of this fitting out, the, the ship would then be taken out to uh, the basin, and it would go through 
six to eight weeks of basin and sea trials, or, or what we call testing today. And then right at the end of that, there would be the, the maiden voyage. So why was this project initiated? Well, it, it, the story starts with White Star. That's a shipping company, a transatlantic shipping company, and they were faced by a pressing business need to really replace their current uh, fleet of aging liners. And uh, they had to do this really to have any chance of competing with uh, growing competition, which was getting quite stiff. Uh, Cunard liners had just launched Lusitania and Mauritania, and these ships were built for speed. So White Star had to embark on a strategy, and I may add it was a very well thought out strategy to invest in, in new emerging technologies and cre- create three super liners, the, uh, the Olympic and Titanic. Now those two would be built first, and then eventually a third ship would come along, the, the Gitant- Gigantic, which would be funded by the first two that would be in service. Now, that's a well-thought-out strategy that differentiated from the competition Cunard liners who built ships for speed. Yes, that's exactly it. White Star's strategy was very much based around luxury rather than speed of crossing, and they believed that uh, luxury would bring these uh, customers back. It was all about the the quality of crossing itself, the the passenger or or customer experience on board, Um, and these ships would be far larger. The the Olympic-class ships, as they became termed, would be about 40% larger than current ships with very spacious accommodation and luxury. So speed would be sacrificed and the ships would be slower than the competitions. But in in reality, what it meant was the ship would, instead of arriving on Tuesday night in New York, it would arrive in Wednesday, on Wednesday morning. And of course, the passengers would have that extra night of accommodation and they would arrive in greater style. So the fleet would be built as Wednesday morning ships uh, where the passage was seven days rather than six days. So the project was begun on a very sound footing. It was. The the business case was very solid, and a staggering 75% of the total revenue was based completely on the first-class passage, meaning it was the first-class passengers that that basically paid for this project. So as a result, the three liners would be paid for within a very short time frame of going into operation. Um, This was based on the break-even point that would be reached in uh, an incredible two years. 